Welcome everyone to this week's IPLD meeting. It's July the 27th, 2020. And as every week we go over the stuff that we've, part, that we've worked on in the past week and any open issues we might want to discuss or any agenda items. Um, I start with myself. I mostly worked on Rust multi-hash. Um, and there, um, so <laughs> the story is that there was a huge PR on Rust multi-hash to make it not allocating as much and just being stake allocated. And then there was a bit um, discussion about it. And then people got annoyed about each other. So the PR was closed, but the, the idea was still good. Um, and it was refactored to something called tiny multi-hash. And now, and I still want to get basically this, this code kind of upstream into the normal Rust multi-hash. And so I work with the creator of this PR uh, on it. And I've made a pull request because the code was kind of, I felt com too complicated. And I couldn't really tell why, but it just, it didn't click and it was strange. Um, and then I took the time to really dig into it uh, which also leads to some documentation I haven't published yet, but is on my machine about what multi-hash libraries should do in general, um, because there's several features that are, might not be obvious, uh, which a library should support. And while I was digging into it, how it works and so on, um, I finally figured out a way that I think is simpler. So I made this pull request, um, which is also linked in the notes, um, which, I think it's a simpler approach. Um, it's very similar to the to the old one, but just like a bit easier, I think. And it's kind of getting completely rid of a code table because normally on the upstream Rust mod hash we have a code table which is then assigns the hashes to a certain code. And now it's kind of like the other way around. And then you assign with Rust magic um, the code the code of a multi-hash to a hasher, and then magically everything works, and it's less code generated, and I think things are more obvious. Um, anyway, it's quite complicated still, um, but if anyone wants to check it out, um, feel free. Um, and to leave comments about it, there isn't any documentation in there yet, so it's probably still hard to follow, but this will be in um, yeah upcoming commits, and hopefully it will be solid enough to then uh, be moved upstream. Um, yes, that's all I have. And of course, next week, I will probably also work on those things. Um, next on the list is Eric. So I did a lot of docs again, um, and a bit more research on advanced data layouts. Some of which showed up in the doc stuff in the docs repo. Um, and some of it is together with Rod, I've been looking a little bit at um, hamps in the wild as they appear in some of the Filecoin stuff and the Lotus code bases and things in that area. Um, and just trying to extract some understanding of like what in practice those folks are doing with these structures already and like just gain information about user stories from that, um, which has been really interesting. It turns out they're doing a lot of stuff that's really I don't know if simple is exactly the word, but they're solving a lot of problems in very direct ways that we probably might have discounted if we didn't see people solving real problems that way. So uh, that's been interesting. Uh, I did a little bit more work on the Golang CodeGen stuff. There's some PRs that are boring bug fixes, don't look at it. Um, but there's also another PR that is maybe fun to look at, which is I cleaned up the generation of the schema schema enough that that is actually a commit that you can look at. And that one will probably be headed to master sometime soon because it appears to work now. Uh, there are some slight drifts between the schema that's described there in those functions and the schema schema doc that's in the spec. Um, a couple of those are to do's for me in the code gen. Um, a couple of them will turn into PRs in the specs repo sometime soon. So um, you can get a preview of those by looking at that code if you want. Otherwise, you can just wait around and show up in the specs repo. So uh, that's about it.
I guess, okay, um, sorry. I, oh. had, <laughs> I, I clicked, I wanted to get zoom into the foreground. And then it told me, oh, you can't minimize zoom, but this window was hidden behind the original window. So I couldn't unmute myself because the you can't minimize window was somehow in the front, but I couldn't see it anyway. So yeah. Uh, next on my list is uh, Peter. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, my update is going to be super short. I actually didn't get the chance to work on anything I built related last week. I am essentially working on my Filecoin tester certification, air quotes. Uh, we basically are working on various uh, ways and uh, designs, suppose how to test and how uh, to use uh, Filecoin with demo drop down the line. Uh, and this involves a ton of meetings and clarifications and stuff like that. The only thing I guess is somewhat IPOD related. Uh, I tried over the weekend to implement my own Campy calculator uh, because the thing that is included in Lotus is super, it's based on Rustify and it is super uh, resource intensive. So I just wanted to see like how, how hard can it be. And uh, looking over the stuff that Brad wrote way back in JavaScript, I actually ran into inconsistencies, not only with small files, but pretty much with any uh, car file of a specific size uh, that is very close to the to the limit or piece. So now I'm actually downloading a couple of uh, car files that kind of match the description to see if our companies are incorrectly calculated. And uh, if I do find files like this, we'll have to figure out like, is incorrect whether it's Lotus now or Lotus before. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Um, next is Chris. Hey guys. Um, so uh, last week I've been working on a little bit more refactoring of Dumbo Drop to unify the configuration. Right now, it's, it's kind of like there's some stuff in the environment variables, some stuff in command line arguments and I think something else. So um, kind of cleaned that up and um, also worked on uh, making it more deterministic um, processing. So right now it's not deterministic, which I mean it works, but I think we better, I think we can make some changes to make it deterministic, which would enable some other things. So a bit of work there. Um, work on some kind of application developer oriented documentation. So just thinking through Typical developer, if they're going to IPL, IPL deify their app, how can they do that? Um, and uh, so I have like some interesting kind of starting work on like configuration, um, you know, so that you would put in a you know dot file or something. Uh, logging, like how would you log to IPLD? How would you manage standing data, um, input files, output files? It's actually pretty cool, but the you know, one problem though. As I keep thinking through it, I keep like discovering new stuff. And I kind of get in this like spin lock <laughs> where I write a page and then like rewrite it because I want to, I think, a better way of like presenting it. So it, it, I'm, not I'm not comfortable with committing it yet, but um, you know, that's been, I've been frustrated with that. And the other thing, I've had some IRL distractions. So some stuff's going on that kind of took away my time last week. Um, I also got a chance to start playing around with DagDB um, because. You know, talking to, to Michael, one of the things they want to do is take Dumbo Drop, which is a typical application design where you have, you know, configuration, logging, and all this kind of stuff that drive it that's in traditional files. And see so if we can move all of that, like 100% into IPLD, and DagDB is kind of one of the key pieces we need to make that possible. Because um, you have to be able to, like, have a, you have to name your objects, otherwise you're writing those names out to a file. And so kind of the goal here is, all configuration, all the input files, all the logs, everything is in a an IPLD, and we use DagDB quite extensively. Um, and so, kind of like uh, I, I personally think DagDB is kind of like a key missing piece to make to really make IPLD easier to use in a complete sense, like for a lot of standard things the applications do. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and so, anyway, that's that's my update. Thank you. Um, next is Rod. It is. Um, okay. 
uh, spent uh, a chunk of time uh, in the Farcoin Hampton, <coughs> um, which is in the IPFS org, and its name is Go Hampton IPLD. Um, there was discussion about moving it to the Farcoins, Farcoin Project org, and um, and so I've opened up an issue there to formalize that, and it looks like there's some um, agreement around that. The, the, one of the reasons that's relevant to this team is that it's its place is, you know, it's in the IPFS org for historical reasons, but its name as well. Um, and also we link to it in our hash map spec. It is confusing that it sounds like a generic hand that somebody could use for IPLD. And it is, it's not bad or anything. It's just being driven by Filecoin. Basically what Filecoin wants and needs goes into that thing and everything else is secondary. Um, it's layout slightly different. And also this question of, um, of context that keeps on coming up. Um, how do you, when you load this thing, uh, how do you know what parameters it's using to be able to read through the structure? Um, and the, this one takes the approach of it's always comes from the code where you're loading it. So you will know when you load this thing what the parameters were that created it. Uh, you don't need to find them anywhere in the data itself. Whereas in hash map spec and um, elsewhere, uh, we've taken the approach that these things are a little bit more generic and self-describing, that when you load them, it would be helpful to know how they were created because without that information, you can't read them. Um, and you may not have that information when you load it. So that's that's a big divergence with this one, and it's not going to change with Filecoin because Filecoin's got this very strong opinion about versioning and where that information comes from, and also the importance of bytes. So that's lacking from this one, and um, it'd be good not to give the impression that this is a generic workhorse that people could rely on. Um, and as Eric's been saying, we're not too far off having a new Go one um, that users can just pull off the shelf and use. So that'll be moved, hopefully. There's a pull request number 52 there that's just, just chock, chock block full of um, uh, documentation. Just I've gone through the code, documented it, um, added some um, surrounding documentation. Um, found a bunch of to-dos in there for things that need testing, Some uh, a couple of things that look like bugs, um, and it's, um, spurred some really interesting conversations with Eric um, about this stuff. Uh, another thing I did was had a good chat with the folks over at Vulcanize DB. These guys are doing, um, they are combining IPLD and cryptocurrency blockchains and Postgres to do query and verification um, work. So IPLD comes in handy because it helps do proof stuff because these blockchains contain these mobile trees that you can do proofs on. And so sticking all that in Postgres is interesting from that perspective, but it's also a good way to hold the data and, and format it. So that's interesting. Uh, it turns out they've got a ton of overlap with the work I've been doing on blockchains. I've been doing Bitcoin and Zcash. They've put that aside, even though they have some support for it. They were decided not, it's not complete yet. They've been doing Ethereum work and I haven't done all the Ethereum work yet and it's turning out to be a nightmare. And um, they've taken some older Ethereum IPLD work, implemented, uh, re-implemented it or, or upgraded it to be actually work fully with current Ethereum um, data. They've even implemented their own um, format for representing Ethereum state, which is kind of complicated. Um, so they have a, a fork of the main Ethereum client that they're doing to use it to extract state information. And um, yeah, really interesting conversation. And I, th I think uh, to, for the Ethereum archiving work I'm doing, I need to lean on what they're doing, um, whether that's um, trying to get them to participate or um, just using their work. And then also, uh, as we've talked about, um, up, either upstreaming or um, extracting their IPLD work because right now it's it's embedded deep in a, uh, a a repo that does all this 
work, but it would be nice to get those things out as codex. Um, and we even talked about doing them as codex for IPLD prime. So um, yeah, Ethereum is the main one there, but they've also done some work on Bitcoin and, and something else. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a good collaboration space there that I want to pursue. Um, I did, I, I spent some time in Seabor again, just tinkering at edges. I was um, grabbing, I was running the, uh, one of the main test suites that the Seabor spec ships, just to make sure that I, uh, I'm on track. And um, I'm at this point where I am deciding whether or not to bother with the indefinite length support, which is this thing where any, any item that has a length, so an array or a string or a byte string uh, or a map, they, there's two modes. You either, you either say what the length is up front or you say the length is indefinite and wait till I give you a break. Uh, and that's good for streaming, but it's not good for DAG Seabor because it means it's, there's variation in the, in the layout that you can have for any given set of data. Um, and so, so for DAG Seabor, I don't want that. I want, I want to be able to turn that off. But to be able to use test fixtures to make sure I'm compatible with everything, it's sort of nice to have that coverage in there. So I've got, already got evolving in there this idea of strictness and flags to turn features on and off. Um, and this is going to have to be one of them if I, if I fully implement it. Where for DAG Seabor, we could say, no, you, you can neither write like that, nor can you read data like that and get away with it. Um, so, I mean, that's one of many. It's really, this is really educational in terms of um, the format, the, the, the ideal IPLD format and, um, and how Seabor is not it in its state. And even the way we've been making DAG Seabor more strict is probably not it either. Uh, maybe because we see problems with that with like the Rust implementation um, when using Cernay. It's you know, there's a number of ways that it doesn't. It's not ideal for our strictness spec, and uh, even the uh, Filecoin Seabor uh, encoder. It's doing. It's not doing any strictness checking at all because they're they're, they're um, making performance and like uh, their top priority. So it'll read sloppy data which could be a problem for their blockchain. That's a different issue. Um, but it'll also, it currently just, it doesn't sort the keys properly in maps. So it won't even write data according to our DAG Seabor spec. So this is, this is why Seabor is not a great solution to IPLD, but maybe there's some sort of evolution we could do with Seabor where it's like, um, not only strictness, but just features just get cut out and you can't any go anywhere near these features to be valid. But, so I was thinking about it. I was, I was imagining a um, instead of DAG Seabor, it's like DAG Seabor strict. Make an entirely new multi codec a codec that was just super strict, and you couldn't. You had to do all this stuff to implement that, and you had to cut out features, and you have to validate on read all that sort of stuff to be DAG Seabor strict. And maybe that could represent our next evolution of data format um, instead of going fully our own but actually carve out a very strict space in Seabor where to call it DAG Seabor strict, you have to do this stuff in and out. Sorry, Peter. Oh, uh, I, I was just going to say it. We already say in the spec for DAG Seabor, we already do say that indefinite length lists are not allowed, that shortest integers need to be used. So we are kind of already strict, but yeah, so you're saying nothing our, our spec is strict. That. Yes, yes, yeah, it's a problem. Our spec is strict, but the but nothing is strict enough out there. None of them are doing it, all this stuff. And we have this float problem as well that is live. And we have real data being produced with DAG Seabor. Like when when Filecoin goes live and is producing DAG Seabor blocks that will live forever, and if they if the sorting stays the way it is, they will not be valid according to the spec. Um, how, how do we deal with live data that we can't change and we've got this spec that says one thing and then we start switching on our uh, DAG Seabor codex to be more strict for reading data. How does that work? <laughs> that's, that's crazy land. So it's like, okay, you're reading Filecoin data, therefore turn off your strictness checks. It's sort of, 
I mean, of all places where you want it to be strict, you want it to be doing anything to do with, you know, cryptocurrencies. That's the strictness is kind of important there. So anyway, we just make the DAG file coin. Get down with it. DAG. Well, that I, I did actually wonder whether that would be the case, but but um, the the Cibor encoder encoder is pretty good, and and it actually it it doesn't implement much either. Um, uh, it doesn't. I don't think it implements floats at all. Um, and it implements just enough, which is ideal. It's just this strictness thing that concerns me because there's nothing to stop other Farcoin clients from producing um, like integers, encoding every integer as a 64 bit. Um, it, it will still read them, even though they shouldn't be according to the strictness rules. Um, but that's also the same with all of our other Seaboard codecs as well. They will all read bad data and say, yeah, that's fine. I don't care. Um, nothing will reject it and say, hey, this is not right. This shouldn't have been encoded like this. This this hash is wrong for this set of data. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and then the last thing was, uh, continuing on his ramblings, there's a pull request in the specs repo 283 for the uh, noting some of this JavaScript number craziness, because that's another area where we run into trouble, and we will run into trouble with every codec. Um, which is the JavaScript number layout. Um, I was going to go into some detail as well, just about in, 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 in general about typed versus untyped and the problem with numbers there anyway, but JavaScript is a very specific way of talking about that. And we don't really have, I don't think we have any other untyped implementations of Daxy or maybe, maybe there is out there, but um, anyway, oh good, that's me. Thanks, uh, next is Michael. Hey, uh, sorry, commenting on GitHub. Um, okay, I uh, did some stuff. Um, uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, everybody needs to apologize to me for last week, uh, thinking that I was not going to figure this out and get everything building for all the different stuff with ESM. So anyway, you're welcome. Uh, that all works. There's a tool called Limbo that we can use to manage those builds now. That's all awesome. Um, that got me thinking about that problem in general, because it is like, it's a lot of builds to manage. Like this is just a lot of extra stuff to manage. So I started thinking about that and I started building this thing um, called IPJS, which is like basically a, a build system to handle this actual problem that we have, but also sort of internally can use a data structure that's an IPLD and can have a native package format. So in addition to making things that can be easily published to NPM like we need right now, that are unified, um, that are universal JavaScript. We also have like a, a future open to us where we can like do really cool stuff with all of the new ESM and all these data structures. So um, I wrote a bunch of code and did a demo of that and sent it around. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then there was, I wrote a bunch of other code in other places. I think I fixed a bunch of bugs in, in block and in multi-formats and in DAGDB and all over. And I wrote some docs, um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Um, I don't know who's next. That might be it. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, any items to discuss? I, no. no, I put some agenda items actually. <laughs> oh, I, somehow I can. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I see the now. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, talk, yeah. It's just I, I hand over to you. I think that's that's easier. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things I've been thinking about, you know, so example, like with, from an application developer point of view, uh, a lot of times text data gets compressed with gzip or whatever. And once you move to IPLD, um, you know, yeah, you could gzip cool. something and stick it in as a raw block, um, or you could hope that there's a block store that will automatically compress stuff. But as you know, some blocks may be more compressible than others. So you don't, you ever run into a problem where if you don't have any kind of hint, you don't know if you should try to compress it without wasting time. And so I, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have talked about compression before, but it, based on my thinking, it seems like having, uh, you know, a DAG Seaboard GZIP codec would make sense or something like that. So essentially um, the data is compressed 
but you can actually follow the links. Uh, you have to decompress it first in the codec, but you can do it you know, pretty memory and CPU uh, efficiently with something like gzip, it's pretty fast. Um, and that allow you to get, uh, and you know, then, then the developer would get to choose, okay, I know this is gonna be a highly compressible data structure, so it'll use that, but if it's not, let's say you have uh, byte arrays or something embedded in your C board that has compressed chunks or something, then you can just use typical DAG C board because you're not gonna get the benefit. So what, what have you guys talked about as far as that goes? Uh, before, we, before we go into the answer, I have a question. Uh, this comes up quite often, uh, this, very, this very question. Uh, in your thinking, Chris, what are you solving by introducing this codec? So what I'm solving is, um, I guess, a more efficient compression for things that are highly compressible. So when you, when you think about an application developer that wants to move as much, if not everything, into IPLD, one of the things they're gonna quickly, you know, a stumbling block's gonna be, well, now I'm using a ton more data storage than I was before um, because it can't compress. And uh, so I think, you know, allowing the developer to have some control over the data that's compressed um, and still maintain IPLD linkability, which is, I think, is, you know, the part that you lose if you just take data, compress it, and throw it into a raw block, uh, I think is the problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, Michael, you admitted, do you want to answer that or? Sorry, I, I missed it. I'm still commenting on this dumb thing. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> sorry. There's a there's a codec. <laughs> no, um, I I, I, th I I thought you wanted to go. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> so Peter actually just thought through a bunch of this stuff recently in in text and some other channels. So maybe he'll be super ready to answer it. But the one the the counterforce that's always incredibly strong is if you do a hash over the compression is just very likely to produce enormous amounts of sadness downstream because you can never vary the compression again. And the oh. compressed it with the ideal compression algorithm is approximately zero, right? Like, it's just not, people will get in arguments about the ideal compression mm -hmm. for some piece of data until the end of actual time. <laughs> So then create a new codec in that case, and there's a compelling reason. I think gzip is so popular that... And then all of your links break, and all of your dedupe breaks. So yeah. And the, uh, the links and... All of your linking breaks. breaks. Yeah. So, I'll say a couple things, because, yeah, I, I do have several threads about this that, that are in different places, so they're not easily discoverable. But um, one is that, like, it is just kind of an obvious easy win for um, storage abstractions and network abstractions to implement compression. So like um, if you have a store and you're worried about like size limitations and you're willing to trade compute for, for storage bytes, implement compression, right? And then you compress everything regardless of the codec. So that's like where you want to get that win and where you're in the best position to decide whether or not you want to make that trade off. Um, transports should all just implement a basic compression because we have optimized like libraries for transport compression. Like, there's no reason that it's not other than people are lazy, um, which is the case right now. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that I'm not that, that I'm opposed to any form of compression in a codec. Um, I'm just opposed to taking general compression solutions and then taking a codec and then making and, and taking a serialization library like a format and then pairing them together for a new codec. Um, because it, it one it creates like a multitude of codecs for every compression and then none of the data that gets created across them is duplicatable um, and we don't have like unified addresses for them but if you imagine like a new block format like if we were writing a new block format we would probably have some form of like application specific compression in there right like we would we would be able to say like oh there's like you know if a CID appears hundreds of times in the same block, there's no reason to write it hundreds of times in the same block, right? Like we could write it once and then we can maintain references to it and we can like create a really optimized like block format, right? Um, and you can see this across some other um, format libraries where, where you like 
if you look at like the, the HTTP header compression in HTTP2, um, and, and I think it's also in HTTP3, it's very specific to headers, right? Like it's, it, it understands the problem space enough that it can create like a really efficient application specific solution. So we may find that in the future, we may have a block format that just like, oh, it, it, it compresses a little bit on its own because we know what, what block formats tend to do. Um, but there's really no need to use generic compression because we're not in the best position as codec authors to understand when somebody wants to trade the compute of a generic compression library for the storage requirements and vice versa. So. But, but the developer picks which codec to use. So, you know, it, it, they often know if it's compressible or not. So they could ha I mean, have the option to say, you know, this is highly compressible data. I'm willing to pay that trade off. No, no, but, but they're gonna then put that data into the network and they're gonna send it to other people and you just made that decision for all the other people, right? Whereas like the developer also picks their block store and if they wanna turn on compression in their block store, they get all of this compression for all of their storage um, and, and they've been able to make that trade off in isolation for themselves and, okay. and not for the data that, that then goes out of the network. I, hmm. it was a similar, something, something that's not, not the same, but it's the same class of, 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 uh, of question came up just yesterday, I think it was, um, with this HAMP. So in the HAMP spec that we've got uh, the, and for HashMap, if we say that, that MERMA 3, particular type, uh, the 64-bit version of MERMA 3, uh, no, the X64 version of MERMA 3 is the hash algorithm to use for it, which is great because, you know, that's, a, that's not a cryptographic, um, hash, it's just a good hashing function for generic use. And then Filecoin is now discussing, in fact, they've just merged, that they're going to switch that to a cryptographically secure hash so that they avoid the problems associated with hash collisions that where people could actually manipulate the knowledge of MERMA 3 to force hash collisions. Great. It turns out that for, uh, so Jeremy did some testing with that, and it turns out that SHA-256 is faster on the average machine than MERMA 3 is um, because computers are optimized for it. Um, and so you've got, you've got this case where you as a developer, you think you're making decisions that, that extend through the whole stack, but other people at the different levels of the stack are also making decisions which are optimizing in different ways. And in this case, you've got operating system and hardware vendors that are optimizing for SHA-256. Um, and we as developers think, oh, no, we'll go to a simpler hash. But no, it's actually not that efficient. So it's the same kind of thing with, with compression, where different layers of the stack and different people involved in those layers are making decisions already. Um, and sometimes it might be best to defer those decisions to those parts of the stack. I'm not saying no to your suggestion. I'm just saying that it's, it's complicated in the way that Mark was talking about. And, and, and frankly, like, I, I think that the place where we're most likely to see a win from this kind of compression is probably not actually in like DAG Seabor and and like you know uh, natively encoded block structures, but just in raw bytes. So I would be curious to have a conversation about like what would raw GZIP codec look like? Like that's probably a, a bigger and more obvious win than any you know, than, than like compressing Seabor, right? Like most most people are, if you really look at their data store, it's mostly raw blocks if they have like a ton of data. Uh, this is certainly true across like all the data that we process. So. Well, um, so I think one thing we do have to have an answer for is if there is a developer that feels that their solution um, requires compression, otherwise it's like IPLD is a non-starter for them. We need some guidance about how to do that. So, um, you know, it, I, do we have, so I, I think saying, well, it's, I mean, off the top of my head, there's two strategies you can do it. One is you can extend the block interface to have a hint that says, this block is compressible. You should try to compress a block store because what we don't want to do is have a block store try to automatically figure out if a block is compressible or not because that can be extremely expensive, a waste of CPU time, especially when the developer can provide a hint. Kind of like, uh, you know, content negotiation on a browser. It's like, hey, this is what I want. And you should give it to me if you have it that way, but I can also support these. Um, it's the same type of idea. You don't want to like have the server have to, you know, guess wrong. I mean, we would, if we did a raw gzip, that would solve it for that. Or you'd say, we would look at it and say, hey, I don't need to compress that. I will say that like, um, 
I don't know where the thread is about this, but we, we talked about this and talked about just like having um, our stores default to having compression on. And there were actually objections that people had to defaulting to it to on because they mostly had video data or they mostly had other data that was already compressed and they didn't want to waste that time. Right. Sure, sure. And so like, 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 again, like I think that um, the best place that we probably have to offer it is in the storage abstraction right now. Um, and I think at the moment our team doesn't manage those storage abstractions. They're mostly on the IPFS side. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not quite for us to handle yet, unfortunately. Um, well, we, I mean, I, I, I think we should, since IPLD is kind of like independent of IPFS, you should be able to build an IPLD application and not have any IPFS pieces at all, right? Well, that is possible. Right, right. That is possible. Right, 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 right. Yeah, um, I mean, like, 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 uh, I have a block abstraction in DagDB, right? And uh, it does not currently have compression. And like, I would be interested to see what it would look like to, to add compression as a feature there. Um, you could actually like, you know, abstract it pretty substantially. Um, there's a discussion, I'll link you to it. Um, there's a discussion in JSIPFS Lite about where that API should go and some of the stuff that they should handle. And, and that includes, they're, they're really thinking about what the block store abstraction looks like because Rockway has been doing work on um, putting the block store in a worker so that you can share it more easily. Um, and this is why like a lot of that, those CID changes came in like as CIDs that we can share across the worker boundary really easily. Um, but yeah, like uh, we should get on the list of, you know, thoughts and potential features um, compression in there as well. So the, the other way you can do it. So if you had a block straight API that had an optional hint, like an optional thing you pass in that could have a hint like that, then that's one way. But the other way, I don't know what you guys think about this, but you could actually have in the application side, multiple block stores. So one that you know doesn't compress, another one that does, and you could choose to save the CID to this one versus that one, and then aggregate up between multiple block stores again and do a lookup, right? So you don't know which block stores, and you, you check all of them until you find it. Is, have you guys mm -hmm. thought about design pattern? That's kind of like the next question too. I mean, what, kind, have, what do you guys think about multiple block stores that, could, that aren't unified, kind of like the way IPFS is? I like to think of them not as kind of in parallel, but more layered on top of each other. Because like I usually put an LRU on top of the block store anyway. So there's already kind of a layering that goes on where like every every actual storage system gets wrapped in like a, a memory cache layer. Um, so that's how I kind of think about it is like you stack them on top of each other. And this is also why I, I very firmly think that like our block store abstractions should, should continue to work with CIDs and not break down to the multi-hash layer because we can actually use the CID as a hint, right? Um, and you can, when you configure it for storage, you can say like, hey, like compress these codecs, but not these codecs um, because we don't know if those compress well or we, we know that they don't and things like that. Um, whereas you lose that level of granularity about the data um, if, you, if you're only thinking about it for, in, from the point of view of multi-hash. Um, yeah. I think one of the oh. concepts, oh, sorry. Um, I think, in IPLD Prime, we have a thing that should allow that multiple block stores ID or something like it, the link context parameter mm -hmm. allows you to peek at some of the immediate context around a link that you're about to do something with. So you can go look for other info over there that hints like, if you have schemas, you can look at what type this is, or you can look at some sibling fields to get some hints about how you want to store things. I think it could be used for that wasn't entirely the original intention, but it should fit. It would be interesting to try. I like the idea. Any part of the scheme would be awesome, actually, yeah. Well, like, like I said, from an application developer point of view, I think we need to have a pretty solid answer about how they can accomplish it. Um, so I don't think we have to hash it out today, but um, I know it will be a barrier, and especially, I mean, Maybe some of the initial use cases for IPFS has to do with data that's not very compressible, like uh, you know movies or I don't know whatever it is, files that are already gzipped, <laughs> already compressed. But um, when I think about using it like DagDB, I mean you you could probably imagine use cases where I bet that data is highly compressible. DagDB is probably very compressible, and if you have a very very large you know database. And we know today, like a lot of databases uh, do compress data because they get a lot of benefits out of it. Um, and, and there's problems when you're sticking 
not compressible data in a database that is compressing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not good. So anyway, or they probably won't compress something like, uh, you know, binary data, let's leave it as is. But anyway, um, I think we should, you know, maybe we can revisit that later on. But um, one, one thing I think related to that, it, I, it seems like, I, I'm, I'm confused, Michael, why IPFS owns the block store API when IPLD is, should not be dependent upon IPFS. It seems like we should define the IPLD block store API that IPFS implements. Uh, so, IPLD should be completely independent from a block store. Like IPLD should <laughs> exist without a block store in the first place. So uh, let, let's, let's like unwind this a little bit. So yeah. I, IPLD is like a set of specifications for data serialization. And so like there are implementations that like don't even think about storage and do, you know, half of the stuff that our stack does. So like when we talk about our stack and then IPLD in general, like we need to keep in mind that there are people that implement only tiny parts of this. Um, and we need to stay compatible with them and that that's like a, it's like a good thing that those exist. It's not like, they're not like competing. Um, so in our stacks, we do have several block abstractions. Um, and most of the time, those block abstractions correspond to storage layers somewhere. Um, they're just usually not owned by IPLD because IPLD tries really hard to maintain um, an agnostic relationship to the storage and network layer. Like that, that's what it really is. Like we, we don't wanna have an opinion about how you store the data. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna hand you an abstraction that you can very easily store, or that we might not even work on some libraries that make that easier in, in the future. We totally can. We can totally make some block abstractions that do this and put them out as libraries. There's nothing stopping us from that. Um, it's really just, um, as a project and at like the specification level, we shouldn't be binding or assuming any particular type of storage abstraction or any particular type of network abstraction either. Do we have a resolver abstraction? Because I think you can't really do linking unless you can resolve links and that requires accessing block stores. <laughs> yeah, so in JavaScript, that is a single function that takes a CID and returns a block. <laughs> so across the whole, across a lot of the JS stack, that's that's what it uses. Um, Eric has a much more sophisticated system. <laughs> uh, no, Eric's is just load as well. It's, it, like it's it's still a callback. Yeah, it's um, still a callback. But th th this this has come up before though, Chris, because we still need this for things like uh, shared mm -hmm. test pictures and like I want to. I keep on bumping into it when I want to like test a library and have a. Uh, a place where I can pull blocks from, um, and just a just a generic way of communicating about how these things are stored. Car files are a great example. So with the car file stuff, and I did Zipcar as well. I built the interfaces around that around the same block storage interfaces that IPFS uses, and they're really clunky uh, for just doing block storage. So uh, it it makes me want something much cleaner to say this is an IPLD block store. This is how we interact with it. And there have been some good discussions about the kinds of features we want from that. And it would be good to have something spec'd out one day, but it certainly wouldn't be an integral part of the stack. It would just be something that we have and use because it's useful. Yeah, I, oh, I should clarify a little bit. Everything that we've done so far sort of in the IPLD stacks are very intentionally agnostic about this. This doesn't mean that we won't take on some work that will make this better. If you look at DAGDB, there's a storage abstraction that's much more sophisticated than this that actually maintains an index of links and things like that. And you can look in, in the thread in JSIP plus light where I'm talking about some of that and like this may need to wake its, make its way into IPFS light and IPFS because without sort of the link indexing over the graph, you can't do very efficient uh, garbage collection operations. Um, and I have an entire replication system that, that's quite nice uh, in DagDB that, that really relies on having those links as well. So you, in order to look through a tree and figure out what data that I have and what data that I need, I don't have to actually retrieve and parse every block. Like that's really expensive in large graphs with a lot of the duplication, which is what you end up with in DagDB. Yeah. yeah. I want to add, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just want to add some, some thoughts on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, a few things. Um, Going back to something you said, a, a developer working with that doesn't want to have this stuff take a whole bunch of space. 
you are implicitly thinking about the storage portion of this risk of the block store. You're not talking about IPLD. Plus, you yourself said that you will have to do the decompression on the fly to basically to read the links and stuff like that. So that's one thing where you're kind of veering off into the implementation detail without actually needing IPLD to have compression, compression being problematic within IPLD, that's number one. Number two, a lot of the space saving in many contexts actually comes from stripping compression. Like that's part of what has delayed Dagger so long is that I need to write a generic decompressor that is transparent and spits out decompressed objects that are representative of compressed stuff from before. So take, for example, um, uh, dev packages, tergz files, uh, the, the Zim uh, Wikipedia dumps, all of them do not, all of them contain in vast repositories, contain pretty much the same data, which will never be duplicated because it is all compressed. If you decompress it, you will end up with a repository that contains all of this, already unwrapped for you at a fraction of the size of what it takes to host the compressed version of the data. That's super important. That's point number two. Point number three, uh, in order for you to have a codec that is uh, verifiable, uh, just like what Rat was talking about with the, um, uh, with the CBOR implementation, you need to have a super standardized and with parameters frozen compression algorithm. You would think that GZIP being there you know, forever uh, is a well-known format and everything can produce the same GZIP stream from the same input. That's absolutely wrong. To the point where I actually have a chain uh, of correspondence with uh, Klaus Post, the person who writes uh, this standard GZIP within, within Go, between versions of the same library, the output changes with the same parameters. And I basically went, uh, got into a correspondence with him like, okay, is there actually something that you guarantee that you will not touch for me that I can actually rely on? And the answer is no. <laughs> with the same parameters, I cannot guarantee you that the actual text, uh, actual compressed result at the end will be the same going forward. So it's super important to keep in mind that you basically, if you do a codec, you will have to have a full complete specification of what the compression implementation of this codec is. Otherwise, Nobody will be able to verify your uh, your blocks down the road, or you'll have to like, you know, have the entire uh, algorithm in Wasm, and everybody just plugs it in, and they get the same the same stuff out, which is which you know which which is the same thing. You simply will have the specification as code. And uh, the last point I want to make about this is that um, compressing. If we are talking about compression algorithms, which are useful for transport. They're generally tuned, and this includes GZIP and, and, and includes um, uh, Broadly and, uh, and, and, and whatever else supported by the, uh, by the browsers these days. They're pretty optimized to not spend too much time when they feel that they cannot compress something. Essentially, putting everything through this pipe is, for all intents and purposes, free. It is not only free in general, it is definitely free compared to the amount of signaling and extra metadata that you have to carry around to your stack to differentiate, compress this part, but don't compress this part. So those are all pieces that you kind of need to put together in order for a codec like this to come you know, together. It's not insurmountable, but it's way more involved than it looks on the surface. So that's kind of all my thoughts about that. I think in general the answer to this right now is the documentation because I think there will be a lot of developers showing up saying I, I want my stuff compressed and for us to patronize it we just wave it off and say oh that's just put somewhere else I think is wrong um, it's not going to be a satisfactory answer but if we can do some education here about those exactly those subtleties um, Peter then that would be really good so something yeah, I should just say this down repo or yeah, we, we need to have yeah. something that explains the position and says, look, we, first of all, you know, you should question whether you really want it at this layer because it, A, it can be done at these other layers and B, it may already be done at these other layers and you don't even realise it. Um, and then talk about the difficulties of these decisions. Talk about the fact that you could do it, you could do it today. If you're doing, if you are doing something that 
has raw bytes and you want to compress it, just gzip it before you encode it in raw. And if if that, and then discuss the problems with convergence with that particular problem. But maybe for things like video data, it doesn't matter because there's there's too much craziness going on there anyway. So there's a lot we could document here. And, and I guess what, uh, one more point actually on, on speed going forward, uh, something that Rad brought up, uh, and for the purpose of the recording, uh, the reason SHA-256 is more efficient than Marmar Hash is because all developers working on Filecoin have these specific AMD CPUs that actually have an entire instruction just to calculate SHA-256 and nothing else, yeah. okay? Which, by the way, goes back to the power of standardization there is no future in which you'll ever see Blake 2 or Blake 3 as part of the CPU because they're not in FIPS. So it is plausible that some compression algorithm, which is less efficient, will find its way in five years into some CPU, and then all of a sudden all your um, specific thinking about this is now encoded in a hash that you can never change. So it's not. Well, we, we spend a lot of time on this, but I think I agree with Rod that as application developers come on, we do need uh, uh, to give them direction. And so maybe one thing we can do is uh, next week, if you guys have Noodle on it and think like, well, what would our, you know, what is our unified, you know, messaging as opposed to don't do it? <laughs> you know, how do you do it? Um, I think that would be good. Maybe we can pick it up then if that's cool. Yeah, this comes up frequently enough that we really do need to deal with it. I use it up all the time, but um, I guess just real quick on the other one. We don't have a catalog of design patterns or best practices for IPLD like stuff right now, do we anywhere? Which stack? New Go, old Go, new JavaScript, old JavaScript, new new JavaScript, Rust. <laughs> They're all uh, so different. <laughs> I, I, I think it's actually kind of language independent. It's kind of like if you're going to uh, like, like for example, like to get maximum deduplication, you don't want to put anything like timestamps in an object. You want to probably put it up at a higher level and link to it. I mean, I, there's got to be things like that. You guys have thought about that. You're like, oh, this is the yeah. way to do it. Do it that way. Don't use floats. Um, yeah, well, and so schemas gets part of the way towards that. A lot of the thinking in schemas and even the documentation points towards some of these best practices. Schemas actually encode best practices in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, it, it would be good to have more high level discussion of that. But I think if you read the schema's docs, then you'd already be in a good position to think about uh, design decisions. All right, we are slowly running out of time. Um, is there anything else? Anything quick? I want to say I try to take live notes of as much of that as possible in the bottom of the document so hopefully that's a gold mine for that documentation I think we all agree we need to write <laughs> oh thank you um, this makes you the official nope. uh, note taker for this meeting <laughs> um, this okay. no guarantee of future Very service <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay so yeah I guess um, that's all for this week so um, See you all next week. Goodbye, everyone.